Somebody say, break down the roof. Break down the roof. Repeat after me. Break down the roof. Break down the roof. Break down the roof. We're going to break down the roof today. Would you be puzzled, though? Would you be? I'd be scared. I'm just telling you. If I'm preaching out here and the roof starts crumbling, I might actually walk out of the building. But this wasn't now. This was back in the days when roofs were a lot softer. They were probably made of wood, mud, and you didn't have to fear of death when the roof starts caving out, right? So let's look at that passage. A few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. How many of you, you know, I, when I go home on a Sunday after service, I like to rest. I like to enjoy my food. I like to take a nap, which is going to be hard with a couple of services, because services coming after Christmas, but I like to enjoy my nap. I like to be left alone. I don't want my kids in my ears. I want them just to take care of themselves, and I want to be at peace. But they wouldn't let Jesus rest. This man comes home, and they, they believe it's Peter's house. But he got so popular with the miracles that he was doing that he wasn't given the freedom or that little space to go rest. But you know what? I don't think he was frustrated. There are parts of the Bible where you know, Jesus shows his frustration but he wasn't frustrated because people were coming to hear the good news. And they gathered in such large numbers. I mean, I don't know how big this house was, but this shows, this passage shows that there were a lot of people present. And there was no room left in the house. No room. There's room here, but there was no room where Jesus was at. Chairs were filled. Probably only standing only uh, room, right? And it says there's not even space outside of the door. That's a little bit hard to believe. There's no space outside the door. Outside this, it's a big space outside the house. There's no space. People are so tight that they couldn't get in. And then here he was inside preaching. I doubt he had a microphone, so he probably had to be preaching loud. So some of the men came bringing him a paralyzed man. And it says they were carried by four of them. I mean, it does make sense, though. You know, if you imagine three of them trying to lower a body down, it just looks a little bit funny. Since they could not get to him, get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it then lowered the mat the man was lying on. You know, I think about these things. These were not, this is not the paralyzed man who was digging for himself. And we do that as human beings, right? We would say, well, you know what? I'm going to push a little bit harder. I'm going to try a little bit harder because my life is at stake. My food is at stake. So I, I'm going to have to work a little bit harder to maybe make some more money. Maybe that promotion that I have been dreaming about still hasn't come. So I'm going to have to find another way. But this passage also teaches us about community and how important it is to place four people, a group of people that you could be surrounded by who could lift you up. But I want to show you the tenacity. Can I get four people to come up here? It's going to be some exercise. Put down your coffees, worship team. Anybody strong? Militia? All right. Four. I just see two people standing up. All right. This is going to be a challenge. Let's see what you guys do. You're going to have to lift me up. No. You stood up. Now you try and you fail. I'd rather see you try and you fail. Both of you. You know, I got the strongest guys, and they're sitting out there drinking their coffees, and they're not waking up. I need a little bit more help, because I have a feeling they're not going to be. I I am 110 kilos. All right? Oh, there you go. I got more. Okay, where is my community? Where is my community? Okay, I see Samson coming up. All right. Let's see how we do this, all right? Come on. Oh! <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we're talking. All right. So now I want you to keep holding me there, okay? So now here, the Bible speaks about carrying. I mean, this was what? We don't know how heavy the man was. He could have been 100. Oh, no. know. You know? Now I want to ask you another question. Would you be able to carry me up to the roof? I, I'm already slipping. Yeah, I'm already slipping. And I was on a mat. The Bible says he was on a mat, right? Lowered the mat. Now, can you get up to the roof with the paralytic man? I doubt it. Maybe. But maybe there's a stairs. Who knows? Maybe there was. I hope there's a lift. Maybe there's a lift. Back in the days, I doubt it. So you can put me down. It just shows you how you can put me down. Thank you. Very gently. I got to preach after this, right? Thank you. You know, you just thought you came for spiritual enlightenment, but here you got physical exercise too. Thank you. Is this for me? The water? But imagine, okay, you guys are all trying, like, oh man, this man's heavy. He needs to go on a diet. Imagine picking me up, not only carrying me all the way to the roof, but then lowering me down, digging through the roof and lowering me down. That that took some work. And I don't know about you, but there are days when I don't want to do that. There are days when I'm like, oh man, he's, he shouldn't have done that. Now look, I mean, the consequences, right? And we have those days all the time. But I love these friends, this community that was there to lift up the person who couldn't, on his own strength, walk and come to Jesus. Surround yourselves with friends like that. And these guys, they break down their roof, you know. When it's our own roof, it's like it's exciting. But I'll tell you what, it's exciting. It's actually, there's more fruit when you break it down for somebody else. And I can guarantee you that in my own life, I've seen the fruits of that. So these guys broke down the roof. It's not their house, mind you. Imagine going up to this building and breaking it down, like, I've got to lower something. We'll see, get some permission. No, they didn't have time for that. Jesus is in the middle of a sermon. And they break it down. The owner's probably going, <laughs> you know, I did not expect when I invited Jesus that my roof was going to be torn apart. Be careful what happens when you invite Jesus in. It's a whole lot of turmoil, a whole lot of things that you don't expect. But I'll tell you what, that man's house was not forgotten ever. How many years has it been and we're still talking about that house whose roof was ripped apart? I'd want some of that honor. I'd want some of that glory. Imagine having Jesus come in and to only have your house destroyed, but a miracle come out of that where, mm, I want that. These guys were risk takers. They could have, could have been afraid. They were like, ah, it's not my house. But they risked the wrath of the homeowner, and they still tore through the roof for their friends. Would you break down the roof to bring your friend to Jesus? Would you break down the door that's keeping your friend from Jesus? Would you push through the crowd that is impenetrable for Jesus? And Jesus, instead of continuing, I mean, he, I mean let's be honest, there'll be days when you're preparing so well for your sermon, and then something happens. You know, I still remember when Ethan was a little boy, he'd start screaming in the back, and it was, you know, everybody was a little mellow back then, so you'd You'd have that feedback from Ethan saying, hurry up, I'm hungry, right? And that was the only feedback you're getting. But here, Jesus is speaking. He's preaching. And the roof caves in. Talk about a disturbance of God. You don't disturb the master. It shows us that, you know, the passage shows that instead of Jesus continuing his preach or moving to another room, he stops and says, hey, they're trying to get my attention. 
they could have spoken to the owner of the house and got a special recommendation to go through the back door. No, they took matters into their own hands and then they, they got the body where Jesus could see it at the feet. And it shows us exactly what we need to do. Are you willing to climb up the roof? Are you willing to carry a man who can't move? Spend your energy to just go there, just to have an opportunity. You know, from a human perspective, there is no guarantee of a healing that could have taken place. You know, there are many times Jesus didn't heal people. But their friend's faith was so strong that it didn't matter if he was healed or not. They just believed that if they would have just got him there, even if he wasn't healed, he'd still be fine. That something would touch the man's heart. Something would happen supernaturally. Something would happen in a, inside his heart that would make him feel better. There was also a good chance that they did not see Jesus, right? The crowds were big. Couldn't get a view of Jesus, even outside the door, as it says. But they believed in their hearts that they would not find a way. Are you a way maker? Jesus was a way maker for us. Now he's asking us to do the same thing. Are you a way maker for your friends? When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, somebody say son. That's some authority there. Your son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sons are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. This is a little awkward, you know? The man who has been paralyzed, he comes. <laughs> I just want to walk. Please just do this one little thing. Let me just walk. The friends hear about Jesus. The man who heals the sick, he gives sight to the blind, who makes the lame walk. So you bring him here and you go through the effort of breaking down a roof. And Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now talk about failure. You're like, Jesus, I, I, I did all of this. And you're talking about sins. I want some legs. That's what I was expecting. Are we praying for the right thing? Sure, there is a need for the legs. But here we see that Jesus has the priorities right, right? Why does Jesus forgive the man of his sins before he heals him? Imagine you're the man on the bed and you're out here expecting to walk. And Jesus here is talking about your sin. And it gets all quiet in that room. That man's thinking, I hope he's not looking at my browsing history. I hope Jesus didn't hear what I said to my wife the other day. I hope Jesus didn't see me stealing. Or worse yet, are you questioning God who can actually forgive your sins? Mm. Probably as quiet as it is here. Or sometimes we hold on to our sins, right? And by doing so, we validate that God is out there to get us. How many of you have done that? Don't raise your hands. And while we try to do that, we try to get some sympathy from ours, our friends, those who don't know any better because they're always, always stuck in the same boat, right? Why does God do this? Why did he kill a person? It wasn't God, it was the enemy. We love holding on to our sin. Now, if you're the man's friend, what would you say if you've gone through all that effort to bring your friend to Jesus for a healing and he only forgives his sin? You know, it wasn't an easy task to lift up that body and go through the roof. That was a lot of effort. But I don't want you to underestimate what Jesus knows about your friend. What you might be seeing is a physical miracle that the friend needs. But God can look past what is of the appearance of the human nature. Can look past that. He can also understand 
the struggles of his heart. He knows the man's needs. He knows which comes first. What use is it to gain two feet if you walk to hell? That might have just gone over for somebody. What use would it have been if Jesus had given him two legs only to continue living in sin? And he says he'd rather be crippled here than go to heaven and go to heaven than walk here and go to hell. I don't want you to want that for your friends. And he shows us how to prioritize what we are to do. The eternity first, the human aspect second. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there. Somebody say sitting there. there. Lazy. Anytime somebody's sitting, unless they've done some work, they should not be on the couch. All right? And these guys weren't just sitting there. They were also thinking. It's never a good combination, right? And I love the contrast of these people. Now think about the Pharisees who were sitting there and thinking. Now think about the guys who got on the roof, dug through the roof, brought the man down, and are probably shouting and coordinating the efforts to make sure the body wasn't all upside down, right? The teachers of the law were sitting. The friends of the paralytic were climbing walls, breaking them down for their friends. Jesus is showing us, or maybe asking us, what is our posture? Are we sitting there? Or are we climbing up on the roof? Are you comfortable in your seat, or do you need to get up and out of this door and invite somebody to the feet of Jesus? Lazy teachers of the law versus active faith. It's not faith when you actually wait. It is not faith. Faith is an action. You believe and you do. They could have said, oh, we'll just wait. We know he can do it. That's not faith. What was the focus of the teachers of the law? They were focused on keeping the tradition. They were focused on judging. They were focused on seeing if this man really was the Messiah. Jesus was here establishing a kingdom while the others were worried about what? Tradition. They missed the boat. They missed the point. How should the Messiah look? What should he be doing? What kind of miracle should he be doing? Should he be working on Sunday? We get all religious, don't we? Who should Jesus be hanging out with? They'd be real happy if Jesus was hanging out with them and part of their clique, right? He was hanging out with the drunks, the tax collectors, the sinners of the world. And here, we are judging people as we go on with our lives like these teachers, like these Pharisees. Or are we the friends that bring people to Jesus? And I love the next verse. Why does this fellow, somebody say fellow, Talk like that. He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? This was a movie. This is where the, the drama intensifies. Dun, 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 you know? You get that music going. Fellow. Fellow. The son of God. And he says, fellow. And then, you know, all of our religious spirit gets inside of us, gets us fired up. Fellow. Yeah, what are fellow? Dialogues are just a cinema in each These dudes didn't know who he was because they didn't believe when they saw who he was. They were caught up in themselves. Do we get it wrong sometimes and focus on the wrong things? Maybe you're looking at a friend and you're like, well, I don't know if I want to invite him to Jesus. He maybe drinks too much. He likes to smoke, so I don't want to come to church and him smelling like smoke and no, focused on the wrong thing. How many times have we fought for God? Like, oh no, you know, we'll have arguments on God's behalf. You don't need to fight for God. You don't need to stand up for his word. You live it and that's how you stand it. You don't need to talk. 
You do not need to talk. God doesn't need you to stick up for him in your pride of who you are. And that's not how the kingdom works. Jesus had to, God showed us, Jesus had to die for you to get close to him. If he was working according to your logic, he would have sent some angels to wipe out people, right? He would have sent angels or whoever it was or Jesus to wipe out the Romans. That's, what, that's how it would have been if it was according to our logic, but it didn't happen that way. And immediately, verse 8, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Notice here that these people didn't say a word. As stupid as they were, they were minding their own business. They didn't say anything. But Jesus knew what their hearts were up to. It also shows that Jesus was God. Because the faces, if it would have said, you know, they, they saw the continents of uh, their posture or whatever it was, you could say, okay, that's a human aspect. But the Bible is very specific here. It says, Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. You can't see a heart. I don't know if, if they think in their hearts, but you can't see it. You can't see what's going on inside. And they're probably looking at Jesus like this, right? And they probably had the same look that everybody else had because they wanted to blend in. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? He's not merely reading the faces and expressions of the people. He's speaking about a condition of their hearts. Do you believe? Or are you questioning who I am? Here the people are questioning the authority of Jesus. But I want to ask you, do you ever doubt who God is? I know I've doubted. But he's there today, tomorrow, even after I'm gone. He's telling us, don't doubt. Jesus can do a miracle in your life. And better yet, he can do a miracle in somebody else's, in your friend's life. Lower him down on the mat. And Jesus goes on to say, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. I want to ask you, you know, just when you're up on stage, everything, you know, you guys are all, how, how many people? We've got 20 people looking at me. It's quite easy for me to say something about a spiritual aspect and walk away with it because you guys can't see it, right? And it might give him the way out just in case, you know, Jesus couldn't perform the miracle. Like, we'll leave it at that. Take the safe way out. How many of you have taken the safe way out? Man, that is not the way out. All right? That is not the way out. Safety is not the name of the game. Not with Jesus. You go at him full speed. You go to him full speed. And you go at him with one direction, not with your feet placed on two different boats. Forgive sins or heal him. It would have been easy for him just to forgive him of his sins because you can't really see what's happening in your heart at that moment. But healing, man, you might be called a fraud. Here you are performing miracles and then when you show up and you can't perform, now you're talking about forgiving sins. That's a double whammy. You're talking about yourself like you're God. Now you can't do what you said you can do. I don't think Jesus' ministry would have been successful if that, if that hadn't happened. For that, the forgiveness was enough, but I think Jesus did this so he could prove to the Pharisees that he was the real deal, that he was God. But here I want us to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I'll tell you to get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man, he got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. He got up, <clears throat> took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. They praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. 
Now let's put our, let's view it from the man on the mat, the paralytic. And here you were, you're still lying there on your mat. Jesus talking about your sins. You're a little worried. Like, what do we do? I don't want him talking about my sins. I thought nobody knew what my sins were. And you know the moment when God looks at you and you know you're just like a, you're naked. How did he know? How did he know? And you hadn't even told anybody. Oh, he knows. And he's got the priority right because he, he says he wants you to get clean. And he, Jesus already knows looking at that man the man couldn't walk, but I'm pretty sure the eyes connected for Jesus. He's looking at him. And he's going, your sins are forgiven. Naveen, I, mean, I just saw a video of you yesterday or the day before. Yeah, it was some music video. You were doing drugs. You were acting it out. And I just thought it was funny. I've never seen Naveen be so expressive. And here I was, you know, I was preparing for this sermon, and I know Naveen as a very quiet guy who just, in the background, strumming away his guitar. You don't really see an expression, and you, I'm thinking, sorry to say this, but I'm thinking that's a paralytic. <laughs> you can't really see anything, right? But in the back end scene, he's out here doing drugs. He's out here stealing things. He's out here doing all kinds of things that you shouldn't be doing. And in Naveen's video, and there's a, and I love how it was done. He's walking on the beach and, and he's looking at the footprints and where, you know, that story of the footprints where you have two pairs and then it, it disappears and you have one pair. And then God's out here carrying you. Now sometimes, it's like that furniture story, right? You need furniture, God gives you trees. Sometimes when you're walking on the beach during a hard time, God's saying, hey, before you actually get out on a journey, surround yourself with people that'll carry you when you're down. Because this journey that you're going to be on is going to be a journey where you will be tired. There will be an emotional drain sometimes. Because belief actually gives you that, 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 maybe that risk. There's a chance it couldn't happen. There's a chance that your friend who you're going to be bringing to Christmas Spectacular might not accept Jesus. But my question is, are you going to do it? Because I'll tell you, when, with that kind of faith, God will honor that. And you might not see it, just like those two pairs of footsteps that disappear and become one. But as far as God's concerned, he's carrying that man. You might not see him walking in the same journey, but God's got him. So I want to challenge you to invite people to take that risk of hurting somebody's sentiment or breaking down somebody's roof and saying, hey, you know what? Here's the ticket that I purchased for you. We heard that story about that treasure that was found and the man sells everything. Now I can tell you the Christmas Spectacular doesn't cost you everything. But it does cost you something because we want it to have a cost. We want it to be something that, that shows value to others. It's one thing to invite them out to the beach. It doesn't cost you anything to sit there, right? But now for something that has value, you've had to pay a price. The people that were carrying the paralytic man had to pay a price. You know how tired you guys were carrying me? I mean, that was six people. And there was no mat. Pretty sure those mats were pretty heavy back then. I don't think they were as light as they are now. It takes effort. It takes courage. How many of you would say, God, give me some courage? Banu, can you get up on the keyboard, please? How many of you want courage to speak to? How many of you struggle with 
Give me a show of hands. How many of you struggle with speaking to a neighbor, a non-believer, about inviting them out to church? Come on. Have courage here. They're not here. Now I want to challenge the very same people. The God who has given you the courage doesn't just go, here's a little courage. No, what he does is actually put you in a position. Now, if you don't think this Christmas event is a divine appointment to increase your faith, to increase your courage, you've got it wrong. This has given you an opportunity to step up into what God has for you. To step into your calling of ministry, of sharing Jesus to your neighbor. To step out into the unknown, it wasn't easy, right? I mean, the man could have said, hey, you know what? I thought it would be empty, but I'm not so sure about the roof guys. Maybe we'll call it a day. Let's see if Jesus comes back tomorrow. I want to ask you another question. What if tomorrow never comes? Now you got friends. I know you got friends. What if tomorrow never comes for your friend? What if like Naveen's video, they had just had too much of an overdose and they don't wake up? Let's use the opportunities God has given us. And I know he will bless us. Why don't you all stand up? I'm going to be praying about courage. If there's anybody here that needs courage to speak to somebody, that needs to go the extra mile to carry somebody with your own effort, but you're scared that you might not be strong enough to carry them, I want you to place your hand on your heart and close your eyes so this is a, a moment between you and God. I'm not out here trying to shame you in front of everybody else, but this is a moment where you can ask God for yourself. If it's courage, if it's strength, if it's provision, if it's, if you're the very person that is on the mat and needs the healing yourself. And I'll tell you this, Beach City Church is a community like those four friends that will break through walls to carry you down to the feet of Jesus. You're in the right place. If you've got a need, if you need to walk, if you've got a sin to deal with, And we looked at that story from different views. And you might be taking a position of a friend. Or you might be the one in need yourself. Whatever your case might be, why don't we, we pray? Heavenly Father, give me the courage to go out and risk my reputation to invite somebody to you. Father, I might be weak, but give me the strength I need to carry that person up to the roof. Father, I don't have much. Give me provision so I can buy some tickets for my friends who I know need your help. I want to remind you that when our hearts are set in God's vision or God's will for 
your life and your friend's life, it will happen. It is for God's will. It is God's will that your friend comes to Jesus. It is God's will that you invite your friend to Jesus. It is God's will that they accept Jesus in their lives. And I pray that you might take one of these characters as your own and not the other two, the one being the Pharisee. And then everybody else who is watching. being amazed are you praising God for the miracle that you witnessed or are you praising him for the miracle that you will witness soon I believe the 24th of December, there will be a miracle that's happening. Many people that you invite are going to come accept Jesus as their King, Jesus as their Lord, Jesus as their Savior. And I want you to think about those friends. And I want you to think about the friends. Maybe they might not be on a mat. Maybe they're friends who might be even stronger than you or more capable, more financially set. But there's a difference though. They don't have Jesus. Would you be the conduit that brings Jesus to your friends? Would you be the strong arms that carry them to the feet of Christ, even though they look real healthy? They're in a crippled state of spirituality. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want you to think of 10 friends that you can say, hey, I, they need Jesus. This is not the time where we sit back and say, hey, I need him for myself. You've been here for a long enough time. You've known Jesus for a long enough time. It's time for you to share the wealth. Heavenly Father, as, as we think about the people, I pray that you open up our hearts and reveal to us who you want us to speak to. Give us a picture in our minds. And after that, I pray that you give us the courage to go out and say, hey, I want to invite you. It's going to be a good time. I've paid for the price. You don't have to do anything. Just like the paralytic didn't have to do anything but be still and be carried by the friends. I pray that you are the friend that brings people to the feet and the knowledge of Jesus Christ.
of faith. He's going to stand strong. But he might be doing something that's a little bit different from what you expect, as we see from this passage. You're out here expecting it one way. speaks about the faith of the friends but had the man not have enough faith to to obey the command of Jesus in his life today I want this to be the day where you pick up your mat and walk when the master says pick up your mat and walk somebody give a, a, a shout offering to Jesus today How many of you know that Jesus is a joy? Yes. 
personally know that. Amen. I'm so happy that you all do. Now we got to sing it with all your voices, your energy, and then we'll end the service. Thank you.